Good morning and welcome to Streaming Media West Connect 2020. Normally we'd be meeting in Huntington Beach right now, but these are anything but normal times, of course. And of course, one of the benefits of doing things virtually is that uh, hopefully more people can join us online than would be able to in person, as much as we'd love to be uh, in Huntington Beach right now. We have a great week of panels and presentations ahead of us. We've got deep technical dives into CMAF and WebRTC. We've got panels on all manner of OTT related subjects, uh, as well as live streaming, ad tech, sports and esports. So we've got a great week of sessions for you. Hope to see a lot of names at, uh, at multiple sessions. And uh, we're gonna kick things off today with something that uh, we haven't done before. Um, and I'll get to that in just a minute, but uh, also wanna remind you that next week we have our content delivery summit on Monday, October 5th. Tim Siglin, who's going to be presenting with us today will also be part of that. And then we've got some deep dive workshops. And if you haven't signed up for those, we've got workshops, uh, a streaming media bootcamp with Jan Ozer, uh, intro and advanced FFmpeg with Robert Reinhardt and uh, WebRTC with Robert Reinhardt, as well as some other workshops from various sponsors. So we've got almost a full two weeks of programming for you this time. And uh, so I'm excited to kick it off with this. But before we go any further, Streaming Media West Connect has a platinum sponsor. And I'd like to thank Limelight Networks for sponsoring the, uh, the entirety of our Streaming Media West Connect. And we've got a little message from Limelight Networks uh, now. Steve, uh, you wanna play that video? At Limelight, we're in the business of connecting people to exceptional digital experiences. Our real-time edge platform has launched and grown some of the largest video properties in the world. When there's a high traffic industry event via the internet, the chances are we're helping deliver it. The difference? Limelight's global private network puts content and applications right next to your customers at the network edge. This result is the most dynamic real-time interactions, no matter where your customers are or what their business is. Like our network, we've also optimized our software stack to be fast, reliable, and secure. And our customers have unrestricted access to live regional technical support whenever it's needed. Limelight Networks has the capacity, the global footprint, and expert service worldwide needed to meet the growing demands for online content now and in the future. Thanks again to Limelight for sponsoring Streaming Media West Connect, and thanks to Zixi for sponsoring this session, which, as I said, is something new for us. Uh, there's no shortage of consumer-focused research in the streaming media industry, but uh, almost a year ago, we looked around and saw that there was a dearth of industry-focused research, uh, research that indicates what's going on inside the industry among service providers, content platforms, and publishers, and the trends that are happening in that space. We published our first state of the streaming industry report in spring with our partner AWS. And I'm really excited to talk today about our second state of the streaming industry report, the autumn 2020 report, which we did as a survey uh, with our partners Zixi and Unisphere Research uh, and uh, Help Me Stream. Uh, again, uh, Zixi sponsored this particular survey. And so I'd like to hand things over for just a moment to Zixi CEO, Gordon Brooks. Gordon, tell us a little bit about Zixi and uh, what led you to do this research with us. You put me on mute, so I had to take myself off mute. So uh, <laughs> welcome everyone. Uh, so first off, I mean, what led us to do the research is, uh, you know, we're always looking for market trends. We're always looking to see you know, what our customers and what the industry is thinking about and, and what are they planning to do in the future? I mean, at Zixi, it's very important for us to, to understand that so that we're, you know, uh, planning ahead our product roadmap, how we're uh, serving our clients so that uh, we're helping lead innovation as opposed to trying, trying to follow. So Zixi is a, has a software defined video platform. So we're a software company. And we help our, uh, you know, traditional and OTT and service providers to source, manage, and distribute live and live linear uh, streams. So we're far, very focused on live and live linear. Uh, we do that over any protocol. So we support over uh, 17 protocols now, uh, which most, most people don't know about us, uh, across any IP networks. We do a ton in, on the internet, but also over managed IP, 
uh, cellular 5G and IP on, on satellites. Uh, we're integrated with all the major cloud providers and with our 17 protocols are uh, really integrated with almost any edge device out there, whether it be an IRD or encoder or decoder or whatever it is that's uh, pushing or taking live or live linear can operate with our platform. Um, and that's all I'm really going to say. We have a session tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, where we'll be talking about the software defined video platform. So if you want to learn more, please join us there. Great. Thanks, Gordon. As I mentioned earlier, this is a joint effort between Zixi, Streaming Media, Unisphere Research, which is the research wing of Information Today Incorporated, which uh, is our parent company, and Help Me Stream, the Help Me Stream Research Foundation. Tim Siglin, in addition to being a longtime contributor to Streaming Media, is the Executive Founding Director. I believe I got your title right, Tim. Uh, right wonderful. Welcome, Tim. Could you talk a little bit about um, sort of the foundations of what we're doing here, uh, and then we'll jump into the meat of it uh, a little bit. But if you could set the stage, and uh, I'd like to remind the audience that if you do have any questions, please put those in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your window, uh, your Zoom window. You can also put them in chat if you'd like, uh, but the Q&A tab kind of makes it a little easier for us to keep track. So with that, Tim, tell us about uh, Help Me Stream, and tell us about the foundations of the State of Streaming Autumn 2020. Sure. So Help Me Stream Research Foundation is a not-for-profit in the industry helping um, uh, NGOs in emerging markets to actually get their critical messaging out. You know, we, we do a lot here in North America and Europe to um, sort of push the, the frontiers of streaming, but there are a lot of places around the world where that kind of thing is what we take for granted is something they don't have. So we actually help do solution designs and then go out well not in the last six months because of covid but normally go out and help do those implementations in different parts of the world as eric mentioned um we've done a 2020 state of streaming earlier in the year and i'll add that if you are on this call and have registered for this you'll get a copy of the upcoming report that's coming out in october but the reason that we went ahead and did a second one of these here within just a six month period is clearly COVID has impacted not just the business world in general, the consumer consumption models, but the streaming industry, some positive ways, some negative ways. So just real quick before we go into the meat of it, what I'm going to say here is that this is a first look at some of the data that came out of the survey what you'll get in the report will be an analysis that compares what we had from six months ago to what we have now. And just to give some basic demographics for this particular um, re research report that we're doing, we call out a lot of the technology vendors out of our initial um, looks at questions because there are a number of you all who, you know, are in the streaming industry who may not be delivering content or creating content. So we want to make sure that we're getting a core group of answers. Out of that, we had just under 300 core answers that we're working from. From a demographic standpoint, um, about 75% of those were from North America, about 20% from Europe, and then the rest of the respondents from around the world. And then one final demographic piece is that we ask respondents where they do work and to sort of prioritize work across continents. What's interesting to me in this is that, of course, North America is, is dominant, Europe is second. A slight trend that I'm seeing that I'll delve into in more detail before I write the report is that South America seems to be rising in terms of the places that, uh, that work's being done. Obviously, uh, Asia, India, um, Africa, the APAC, a, a bit lower down the list on that. So Eric, I'd say let's go ahead and go to the, uh, the first slide here. Okay, so as Tim said, we, we started by looking at the types of organizations that are, are being represented in the State of Streaming Industry Report, the people that we surveyed. Uh, we did separate out those, as Tim said, uh, that are tech vendors uh, because they are not necessarily creating and distributing media. So the, one of the very first questions we asked was, 
does your organization create and or distribute media content? And you can see the, the possible answers they had to choose from uh, on the screen. And here were the answers that they, that, that people came back with. And Tim, if you could sort of walk us through uh, what your takeaways are from these. Sure. So one of the things that I would say here, Eric, is that in the past, we asked this question in a slightly different way and had some nebulous answers. This is fairly straightforward here. As you can see, the vast majority of those excluding tech vendors who took the, uh, the survey both create content and distribute that content. And of all the respondents that we have, we only had 8% who said this isn't applicable. Those, for instance, um, might be people who are in executive management at a licensing rights company or something along those lines. But um, what this tells us, at least from the initial standpoint, is those people who took the survey actually are in the trenches of creating and distributing content. Gordon, did you have anything else you wanted to add on this particular one? I actually think it, it, it is very representative and it's, it's the group that we, we really want to get the, uh, an idea of what they're thinking about. It's interesting because there's overlap with both create and distribute, but 75% of the respondents uh, create and 85% of the respondents uh, distribute. Uh, and, and, and this is pretty much what we're seeing in the industry because, you know, you've got the, you know, the NBCs or the people who are creating content also distributing it to all the OTT providers and, and all over the world. And then you've got, you know, traditionally the OTT, which are, are distributing, uh, like the, our customers like Amazon video or uh, Fubo, but now they're creating live and real content. So, um, I, I think the worlds are, are mixing where. Almost everybody's going to try and uh, create and distribute uh, eventually. And one point that we don't cover in this particular presentation today is there's another question that asks about, you know, what your revenues are. And we have a number of people who create and distribute content that aren't revenue driven. NASA would be an example with the, um, you know, the Dragon X launch a, a couple months ago. Uh, obviously, educational institutions, they don't consider it a revenue stream it's part of the tuition but ultimately they do both create and distribute content true our next slide also shows how how things are blurring right how more and more businesses are distributing both traditional media and streaming over the top content as well as the mix of live and on demand content and and you know for me the thing that jumped out here was how the live, the amount of live content that's being streamed has, has really grown, even though live events have sort of fallen by the wayside, at least in terms of having people in the stands or people in the audience, there's never been a higher demand or a higher or a stronger push for live content than there is right now. Tim, walk us through uh, these results, please. Sure. And let me say that the way that these were actually asked um, to those who took the survey was on a sliding scale. So for instance, if you look on the left-hand side, this traditional media, streaming media, what this isn't is, um, it's not someone saying, I only do streaming media or I do traditional media. What this says is on the continuum, companies or respondents to this survey were more likely to do a greater amount of streaming media than traditional media. And the same is true on the right-hand side, Eric, as you mentioned, they're more likely to do live content than they are to do on-demand content. This one's fascinating to me because, and I'm gonna delve into this a bit more. And when we looked at the last survey six months ago, on-demand was the majority. Um, I believe if I remember correctly, it was essentially 52% on-demand. Um, what this tells me, as you said, Eric, is not just opportunities for live, but I think to something Gordon mentioned earlier, live linear as well. And we've, we've seen over the last couple of years, live linear has started to rise in importance overall in terms of the, the mix of live versus on demand. Gordon, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not surprising to, to, to me either. I mean, one is live content. You don't know really how much you miss it until it's not there. 
Uh, so I think we're all acutely aware now of uh, how important live is. And, that, and that's where really a lot of the, the money is in the media industry. Uh, but live linear, I mean, you know, there's, you know, some people predicting live linear was on a decline, but uh, you look at new service offerings like customers like ours, like Peacock, we launched with NBC. Uh, it really has a live linear focus for any of the OTT providers really, really trying to get all the live linear local feeds. Um, so we think live and, and live linear is, is uh, alive and, and, and very well and, and probably growing in importance. And, and also with all the premium services and all the things you can do, it's, it's a little confusing and very expensive to get all these different services. So you see more and more people willing to deal with some advertising and some other things to get, to get content. Very good point. And our next question, we looked uh, a bit more behind the scenes and uh, asked respondents to indicate what percentage of their streaming infrastructure will be software defined versus hardware defined over the next 24 months. Obviously, we've seen the trend from hardware defined to software defined, geez, going back over a decade now, uh, certainly, but it's only grown. And Tim, do you think that that the events of the last six months, or I should say the the major event of the last six month six months has impacted why we see such a strong drive towards software defined infrastructure I, I do and here's one of the things that's interesting in the industry you know I came out of motion picture production and video conferencing nonlinear editing before I came into streaming and one of the limitations that we've always had sort of in the non-linear editing space is you physically had to be in front of a fairly powerful computer to do, um, you know, to do even crash edit. What I've seen in the last two and a half years and definitely accelerated in the last six months is every part of the production workflow can be done remotely, fairly robustly. And that, obviously goes to the point of software defined infrastructure. Um, if you don't need specialized equipment sitting at the houses of the people who can't go to the, you know, the production studio and or the editing suite, then it, it really pushes one of those last holdouts forward in terms of software defined. And I know Gordon, you said that you're going to, you're going to talk tomorrow about software defined, but talk a little bit here about what you all at Zixi consider software defined versus hardware, because I had a number of people also respond. I'm looking at a hybrid approach between the two. Yeah, I, I think you for for a time you will see a hybrid approach. I mean, we're we're software defined. I mean, we we our whole platform is a software defined video platform, and it was software defined from the beginning. So everything we do is cloud native. Um, you know, there's hardware defined and then there's containerized hardware, which doesn't give you the true uh, flexibility and, and capability that you're looking for in a software defined environment. So there's reasons to containerize true software defined infrastructure, which is, which is fine. So you got to be, be, be careful about that. But, you know, I think this trend has been going on for, for quite a while. Um, but our industry requires a little bit of a push. So um, the, the plans to go virtual and to be more software defined have been there. They've been slow to kind of take off and some have been, you know, really leading the charge, you know, the Bloombergs of the world and, and people like that are, are really out there. The NBCs of the world are really out there in terms of doing a really good job of this. Um, but um, I mean, with COVID, that, it was kind of a break the glass moment, right? You take all these strategic plans that people have and all of a sudden, you know, tying people to physical plants, uh, you know, is, a, is not a good thing. And, and in the post COVID world, I, you know, I don't see anybody who's going to go back to trying to do that. I think everybody's going to try and virtualize as, as much as they can. I mentioned Bloomberg. Bloomberg went from in New York, 6,500 people down to 40, I think, in a very short order when COVID hit because they were software defined and everything could be done remotely or almost everything. Yeah, those are some pretty remarkable numbers. And obviously, you know, we've seen those numbers everywhere in our industry. Uh, and, and when we say our industry, you know, it's, it's both the streaming OTT specific industry, but also the, the wider broadcast and video industry. Isn't that, isn't that correct, Gordon? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's kind of a, a mega trend that is uh, just got just got boosted, and now I don't think there's vaccines and things like that aren't going to slow it down. That's not the reason it's going to happen because we'll see later. Uh, there's a lot of benefit uh, around uh, being able to do things in a software defined environment. And Gordon, it's, not, it's a... not just cost. It's cost is the least important, which is the interesting thing. Okay, yeah, we sure. actually have an audience question uh, asking about what the key approaches uh, to software defined solutions are. Uh, it says it would be great to understand what are key approaches, what type of software approaches are most effective since it involves so much. I know you're going to talk about that tomorrow during your tech talk, but is there anything you can say briefly about that before we move on to further survey results? Yeah, so I mean, so Zixi has 200 uh, and I think it's up to 240 integrated solution partners that have Zixi integrated into the workflow. And we started with kind of IRDs, encoders, decoders, uh, and then went to cloud providers. Now you see it's uh, embedded in monitoring systems like TAG or embedded in uh, uh, editing systems or clipping systems like Blackbird or EditShare so that the, the entire workflow is being done uh, in a software defined way so that you have a seamless way to move through your workflow um, uh, without having to break in and throw in a box to do protocol conversions or things like that. So we support 17 uh, protocols. Most people think of the Zixi protocol, but that's one of 17 that we support. But the idea being be able to do that switching and all that work in a software defined environment, especially in live, live linear, so that you're not getting the, uh, the the uh, latency degradation of moving from hardware to software. So it's not not perfect yet in the world of, you know, there's still a lot of hardware out there, but it's 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 going to be 90-10 probably in the next couple of years, in, in my opinion. And Eric, I'll add something else here too. You mentioned the meta issue, and I, I mentioned, you know, nonlinear editing, which Gordon has noted a couple of those companies. Also think just on the raw production side, you know, when you think about what new tech's done with NDI, I mean, essentially it's an IRD. It's a small box that's a transceiver from a traditional broadcast feed around a room to push it out across IP. Ultimately, there will be small pieces of hardware that are part of it, but it's the defining the infrastructure in a control panel through software to say in this given use case, I want to do these particular things with this piece of hardware. And like Gordon said, if he supports 17 protocols, your use case for these two hours of production may be different from the next two hours of production based on the way that you're, you're using the software to define that. that. That's a good point, Tim. I mean, we uh, fairly recently integrated NDI because we, our customers are asking us to get more into the production realm. Right. And another thing that's very important about software defined environments is uh, the telemetry and being able to get kind of atomic levels of, of telemetry across all the different software and hardware and network components and being able to make sense of that, manage that and, you know, you know, predict issues before they happen, you know, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about quality of experience and everything else we're talking about and building to is making sure that experience is, is perfect. And that'll be a nice segue when we get to the machine learning um, slide a little yeah. down the line. Absolutely. Uh, and for our next slide, we're going to jump in specifically to talk about transport. Uh, just a reminder that today we're going to be going through, oh, about 30 or 40% of the questions that are covered in the entire state of the streaming industry autumn 2020 report. Uh, if you're signed up for the webinar today, if you're watching, you're going to get a copy of that report, so look for more. But we really want to focus on what is going on within the streaming industry here. If you have any questions, again, please use the Q&A tab, and I will relay those questions to Gordon and or Tim. But let's jump right into video transport. We asked our respondents, uh, over the next 24 months, what will your company's primary IP network plan be for video transport? And you can see the various choices that uh, they were given on the screen. Tim, can you walk us through what the results show us? Sure. Um, this one's fascinating to me because, you know, I'm old school enough to think about having very specific types of connectivity for, um, for broadcast transport. 56%, um, obviously more than half, talking about using standard internet connections. 
Interestingly, cellular, um, a, a lot lower than I expected. Um, satellite, not really that surprising, although we didn't allow people to choose multiples in this. This was a tell us what your primary plan is. I suspect if we had allowed multiples, you'd see you know, a bit of a variation on these numbers. But ultimately, um, the internet part really surprised me as high as it is. The cellular surprised me as low as it is. And Gordon, I know you and I discussed this a bit in a previous call, but talk a little bit about this here, because I, I think video transport, old school, we always assume it had to be dedicated. Um, here, it's clearly showing we'll work with best effort networks. Yeah. Well, as you virtualize, I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of getting uh, away from the rigid solutions like fiber and like satellite. I mean, there's always, uh, you know, the right place and right time for any of these technologies. So it's, you know, there's, there's a, a good time to use, you know, all of these. But, um, you know, we're happy to see the, the internet piece be so big. I mean, we've been doing this for 13 years and uh, I think uh, in the last, probably 10 years too early. So uh, it, we've really seen this, uh, this transition and this transformation. And we've been the beneficiary of that and had uh, you know, a lot of time to really harden and, and build out our partners and our, our platform. Um, so I think cellular is, is misunderstood, 5G. So we're doing, um, we're doing production pilots right now with Verizon and with AWS Wavelength Zone. Um, it was just, Verizon just announced some of that uh, uh, last week. Um, and, uh, and people are, we have a major broadcaster that we're gonna go live with, uh, we believe in Q4, so in the next couple of months. And it's the B2B workflows, it's not the B2B to C. B2C is gonna be there in time, but the B2B stuff there, it, it, I mean, is there right now. So I would, I would bet you 5G, uh, you know, if we look out two years from now, it becomes at least uh, 25% of this. Hmm. So it, it's, I think it's misunderstood and people don't really understand how much is there or even what workflows they should be using it for. So we're helping customers think, through, think that through and we'll be putting out some white papers and some best practices on that in, in the near future. Tim, we've got a question from the audience uh, asking, how do you differentiate CDN and internet in this question, doesn't a CDN use the internet by default? Uh, how are we breaking that down? Sure, so for us, um, and this is a question that we actually started asking, I believe last time around. Um, for us CDNs, the assumption is they've got multiple peering points um, at, at interconnects where internet tends to be, you're buying it, um, or sorry, you're using it in a location that it is being used for other things besides just specifically CDN traffic. Now, obviously there's some self-selection as people um, uh, answer these questions, but that's how we define it from our side. There's an interesting, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd call it a trend, but there's some, some real interest in terms of using a CDN to do B2B distribution to IRDs and, and, and decoders, uh, which most of them don't take. Uh, HLS at, at this point, but as an alternative to satellite to get kind of uh, large scale distribution when you're trying to distribute to, you know, thousands of, you know, affiliates, for example. So something to keep an eye on uh, using the CDN as a you know, more B2B uh, workflow tool. So it's early. So I, I don't know how much is, that's going to happen, but there's been a lot of chatter on that. And Eric, let me take this next question that just came up here. I'm going to frame it and bring it back to Gordon. So one of the, um, one of the questions that came up was about the, you know, 65% of streaming infrastructure um, being allocated is software defined. But from a video networking point of view, we can't even determine optimal data paths for video data from the origin to the user. Um, the question is, how do we have a holistic view of the network to optimize for video network? And, and let me ask a add on to that, do we need to optimize for video networking? Because back when there were, 
land switches that were aware of media type content and you would prioritize. Obviously we've got on the WAN side, certain protocols that, that allow for optimizing real-time traffic. But, but I guess, Gordon, is there a way from a, from a video networking standpoint for an engineer, you know, the old class one engineer to be able to understand and visualize the best sort of routing path uh, across um, a, a data connection? So, so uh, first off, the, the software like, like, like Zixi and, and, and some of the other protocols are do, do the, uh, on a single path, do the optimization. So they can, you know, Zixi protocol can handle up to 40% packet loss uh, and still deliver, you know, a, a great picture. And 40% packet loss means you have really no network left, mm -hmm. right? So it can really handle that. And then you always want to have the right architecture where you have the right redundancies. And so what we typically do is, is architect redundancy. And then we have things like hitless failover. So that's a, a, a patented capability that we have that you can fail over between internet to internet, but internet to cellular or internet to fiber, you know, and, and, it's, and it's truly hitless with the, with the right, right pass. Um, uh, we also have bonding so that you can bond two different uh, uh, networks and, and either use it as a failover or use it to take capacity from one if it starts getting diminished in another. So there's a lot of ways to optimize. And then we have tools like trace routing. So you can look at all the trace routes to see where everything's going. Um, but really a software does most of the optimization if you have the right uh, architecture where it can, it can take care of, a, of, of a, a troubled network, but also allow you to fail over or, or borrow from another network. So it's come a long way uh, since, you know, really even in the last five years. And I'd add to that too, that what's interesting with people working from home with, you know, with Zoom calls like this is there's been a significant uptick even in the consumer space for things like Speedify, which is a VPN that essentially lets you bond multiple connection types together. So if your mobile phone is hooked up as your USB modem to your laptop, um, uh, along with your cable modem, that that understanding that we need some of that that sharing capability or that bonding capability is is beginning to emerge in the consumer psyche as well. Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's jump ahead. We have a, a, another question coming in. Also, I noticed someone raised their hand. Unfortunately, given the layout of Zoom on my end, I can't see who raised their hand. If you do have a question, <laughs> instead of raising your hand, if you could just type that in the Q&A box. Uh, that way we'll be sure to see it. Uh, real quick, uh, Mark Kogan asks, are you distinguishing between contribution and distribution and what about hybrid networks? Real quick, so we can get back to We've the got a slide on the breakout of contribution and distribution. Let, let's hold that until we get over to that slide and then we'll Terrific. see if we answer Mark's question. All right, uh, so for our next question, we dove deeper into live video IP transport protocols in the market. Uh, there are many out there. Zixi is one, but SRT, RIST, RTP. Over the next 12 months, we asked people if they plan on using a single protocol or multiple protocols for live video transport. I think it's no surprise that most are planning to use multiple, but Tim, were you surprised by the number that, that chose multiple? I, I was actually. Um, you know, I, I think what this speaks to, and, and Gordon has talked about this, is if we're virtualizing our workflows, um, if we're pushing them to where it's not hardware defined and it's software defined, we know that there's the, the need to be able to bring in content from multiple locations. And Gordon, I think as we talked before the call, you have instances of customers who sort of lock down on one protocol and make sure everybody has to use that, but you've also got other customers who are receiving feeds from multiple lo locations that require different protocols. What's your sense of why the industry is is sort of accepting multiple protocols as opposed to locking down to one particular you, you know i i think there's some there's some religion involved with protocols you know whether it's uh, open source or whether it be standards based or whether it be industry leading you know there's different schools of thought on, on that so you can go to a customer of ours like nbc which will say here's how you 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 if you want our content here's how you take it 
which leads the people who take it to have to be able to take multiple protocols. So if you take a Fubo that, you know, in the OTT world uh, or a Comcast CTS, which is a service provider that is, is doing a lot of content uh, repurposing and distribution, um, they don't control what protocol it comes in on and they don't control what protocol it necessarily needs to go out on. And you need that, that, that flexibility. So um, that's why we went uh, to 17 protocols and, and we'll do including NDI, but SRT and risk main profile um, so that we're covering them all. And, and I think that's just an important part of our strategy is to make sure that our platform is future proofed because you don't know what the next protocol is gonna be, right? Or the, or the next standard is gonna be. And so we wanna just make sure that we're providing an any to any solution. And I think that's what, that's what customers are looking for. But I think what, what's driving this in, in a perfect world, you might pick one or two, but you might be worried about, am I picking the right one? Uh, I think the world's changed and there's so much sharing of content that uh, I think you have to support everything. I don't think you can control it. And I think one of the key other points here too is you're dealing with live and live linear. Therefore, no, any additional latency is a bad thing. Um, so from the standpoint of being able to do multiple protocols, you're killing off that potential Hydra that rears its head, you know, requiring conversion between protocols. Yeah, and, and if you're a Fubo or somebody else, I mean, you don't want to be building uh, an ingest system for every protocol and then have to have something to do switching. And, you know, it just makes it, uh, it gets more complicated the more protocols that are out there. Um, and, you know, and there will be more. But I, I you know, I th this is cyclical. It gets a bunch out there and then we, some really catch favor and then some more will come up and, you know, the, the key is just to make sure that you're, you have the flexibility to go any way the market decides to go. Which is why software defined networking makes, or infrastructure makes sense. I, exactly. And that's a nice segue into our next question. Uh, if you're dealing with multiple protocols or if you're dealing with uh, multiple solutions anywhere in your streaming infrastructure, and more and more organizations are, right? As more and more organizations who might've been delivering SVOD are suddenly starting to deliver live linear or through mergers and acquisitions, people are forced to combine existing systems or if they're building a system from scratch, they're looking for a best of breed approach, uh, taking solutions from multiple providers interoperability is a key concern. And so here we asked our uh, survey respondents to indicate how important interoperability is in their streaming infrastructures. And, uh, you know, if you combine the mission critical and high importance, uh, it's, you know, almost 60% said that, that interoperability is absolutely crucial to what they do. Tim, your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think, Eric, this goes to everything from formats like CMAF, you know, as, we, as we've talked about, to ad hoc standards like HLS. I mean, ultimately, if you start even at that basic level um, or even start even further down with Codex, the questions these days uh, in the responses that we get are not about hey, let me scrap everything I'm doing and put a whole new system in place. The questions that we get from a consulting standpoint are, here's what our existing solution is. Here's what we see is potential new benefits out of a codec, a format, a transport protocol, what have you. How do those fit within the already existing workflow? Because while we may see some companies who experiment with a pipeline that's completely off to the side and they're doing it just to see what they gain from that. In reality, we all have entrenched solutions, um, entrenched infrastructures, and interoperability will continue to rise in importance as opposed to falling away. And I know, Gordon, you said that there are these, on the protocol side, you know, there's the ebb and flow. But in reality, if we start looking at the interconnect between formats, codecs, protocols, transports, et cetera, interoperability really seems to be a critical factor in decision-making these days. I, I think so, because again, um, I mean, I'll give you two examples, uh, you know, uh, three, you know, like Warner Media. just look at all the consolidation and the change going on there and, uh, and all the, you know, 
streamlining and interoperability is, is key. Same with uh, CBS Viacom, right? Uh, just mega mergers and, 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 and people coming together, just it'd be almost impossible to do if, if you had to kind of swap out everything. Uh, another example is AWS. So AWS Media Connect is all Zixi underneath. So they're getting into the cloud, moving across the cloud or getting out of the cloud is Zixi and all the protocols they support are Zixi protocols. The reason they did that versus building it is all the interoperability. It's all the integrated partners. So it's, it's, you know, you, know, you, uh, you know, if you can have 240 integrated partners um, out there, that really does a lot to, uh, to enhance interoperability, right? Then you throw in some standards-based capabilities and some open, open source capabilities, and, and all of a sudden you, you really got an any to any kind of interoperability. And that, that, that's what we're going for, because that's what we think the market wants. And it's a sign of a maturing market as well. That we're having these conversations now as opposed to, hey, what can I come up with that will mm -hmm. replace everything that's that's sitting there in my pipeline right now? Yeah. For our next question, we asked people about moving to the cloud. And uh, just like people are moving from hardware to software to find more and more people are embracing the cloud and virtualizing their video streaming infrastructure. And so we asked what they saw the biggest benefits were for moving to the cloud. Uh, flexibility came in number one, but reliability was a close number two, followed by cost savings, time to market, and a virtualized workforce, supporting a virtualized workforce. Tim, did this ranking surprise you? I kind of expected supporting a virtualized workforce to come in a little bit higher based on the new normal that we're all talking about. Yeah, I, that's the only one of these that sort of surprised me was the fact that it's further down the list. Having said that, if we'd asked this question six months ago, it probably wouldn't have even made the top five because there were, I believe, 10 choices on this particular question. Um, and ultimately that, that rose to the, at least the halfway point. Um, what I do find interesting, and this goes to, to Gordon's points before, is flexibility. If we're talking about interoperability, software-defined infrastructures, flexibility makes sense. Reliability, and we'll come to a, another slide here in just a minute to talk about the decisioning around reliability um, coming up second surprised me because my assumption would have been cost savings would have been sort of to the top. And in fact, we'll find as we go into the next slide that cost savings actually drops even further down. Gordon, any just quick thoughts on this one? Yeah, I, um, I, th I think that that feels right. I would say I cost savings is everybody's hyper focused on cost, but it's it's not the reason you do this. Even though you can save money if you do it right, but it is around flexibility and really uh, reliability. So I, I would have thought maybe faster time to market might have been third, just because um, you know it's 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 such a rapidly changing market. People are having to do things on the fly, and there's a lot of talk about doing pop-up channels and, and things like that. So, but uh, not really surprising. I think cost is always important. Everybody's looking at it, but I don't think it's the driver. Well, let's dig down a little uh, deeper into reliability then. Uh, we asked respondents that if they chose reliability as a benefit to rank the following reliability factors in order of importance and uptime came in as far away, the most important reliability factor followed by QOE and QOS. And then again, cost came in, in this case, uh, fourth. Um, shouldn't uptime be table stakes at this point? Uh, or are we still so concerned about uptime that, that, that we need to place it that high on our, um, on our concerns list? Gordon, you wanna take that first? Yeah, so I, I, it's interesting as we move you know, part of our, our, our precious cargo, the really precious cargo to, to terrestrial delivery. Um, there's still a lot of people who aren't quite sure that it's up to six nines. And I can assure you it is if you architect properly and use the right software, but um, I still think there's a lot of um, people, you know, just, you know, trying it, but need to be convinced. So we're, we're probably only in the, I'd say the 
first or second inning of this move to, to terrestrial. So it's still, I think, pretty early. But if you look at uptime, quality of experience, and quality of uh, service, I think all those relate to QOE. And it's all about making sure that the customer, if anything goes wrong and things do go wrong at times, that the customer never sees it. And I, th I think that's what that says. At least that's the way I read it. I would agree, Eric. Let's move on to the next one. Sure. And again, someone raised their hand in the chat. Um, Steve Nathans Kelly is monitoring the chat, but if you have a question for our speakers, please put it in the Q&A tab. Now let's start talking a little bit about 5G or a lot about 5G. Uh, it's still something on the top of everyone's mind. In fact, we have an upcoming cover story in Streaming Media Magazine uh, that looks at the trends in 5G usage. And so we asked respondents what they think the most likely use cases are for 5G and video streaming. And here's what they said. I'm going to pass it on to you, Tim, because I have to cough. Okay, sure. No worries. <laughs> um, so, so these were the, uh, the options that people were given. And Gordon, I want you to go ahead and touch on something because after we started looking at the results, your argument is that B2B isn't just business level transport. So talk a little bit about that here real quick, and then I'll take it back into the results. Yeah, I, I just think a large part of the contribution and the distribution is, is B2B as well. Because, uh, I mean, we said direct to consumer, so distribution, I, I would think most of that would be thought of as, you know, a, a B2B uh, transaction. And, and what we're seeing in 5G is the B2C stuff is coming, but a lot of the B2B stuff is already there, right? And so, um, so we're doing, like I said, we're doing uh, a production uh, field tests where we're taking uh, content from a major uh, broadcaster. Uh, it, this one happens to be in New York. We're moving it on Zixi over the internet into AWS. We're moving it from AWS uh, into a uh, different region into the AWS wavelength zone. And then we're pulling it with a MiFi device uh, uh, in Boston. And then we're displaying it with about 200 milliseconds of, uh, of, of latency. Uh, and it's working extremely well and it's all 4K. Right, and then we're taking that content and we're doing it back. So we're, 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 they've been running for quite a while now. These workflows that you think of as traditional workflows, just think of this because it, it's going to an IRD. Think of it as taking it to an MSO or affiliate. Uh, those kind of workflows for distribution and contribution are, I think, are going to be the first things to go for for the media industry on 5G. And if you can see, you know, contribution business transport and distribution adding up to, you know, well more than uh, half of, of how people think they're going to use 5G. And I think that's important that it does add when you aggregate those together. Um, and even if you're talking about in venue delivery as being part of the production process, um, right. you know, that the, the majority there is beyond direct consumer. But I also think to your point on understanding whether it can be used for contribution and distribution is something that we have to educate the marketplace for. Um, will that be, will that education be people looking at the test that you've done and performed, or will that be them going out and trialing their own solutions? Or how do you think we educate the market to understanding that it's, that it's much more than just the contribution side? Right. So the, the first one we'll probably go live with is a distribution workflow to, to IRDs. Um, and, um, and I think the way we'll educate the market is actually doing it in production and then talking about it. And, yeah. and um, I think you'll see, you know, all the major cloud providers, all the 5Gs. We kind of look at the, the, the four Cs. We look at content. We look at cloud. Uh, we look at uh, cellular, which is uh, 5G, 4G, and we look at, um, what's the 4C? I can't remember what the 4C is. But it's how all those things come together for, you know, kind of how you think about the, uh, the partnerships and how you kind of get 5G to work. But we'll do white papers and we'll do things like that. But I think what we're going to do is get people live 
and then uh, have, you know, uh, get that word out and then give people opportunities to pilot and show them how it works. And because and, it's not simple, it's not, it's not just turn on 5G. There's, there's a whole ton of nuances to this that we've never seen before that we're learning about as we go and put these in production. And we'll, we'll go out and share that information. And also the variabilities of the types of 5G because we got an M wave and, and the like. Yep. Um, that and, and, and just things like, you know, you're going to have 5G and you're going to have 4G LTE advanced, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then you might have internet as your tertiary. And, uh, you know, uh, do you do a how do you do adaptive bit rates? Well, we do it in our software, but, or maybe you do it with HLS, but you have to really think about that. And then how do you do hitless failover? How do you do bonding? All, all very different things because it, they're, they're following paths that just, we, you know, most people have not seen before. So it's fascinating stuff. It really is. It's cool. Very so cool. Though. One final yeah, question. Actually, Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Oh, I was just going to, uh, you go ahead, Tim, and then we'll. I was just going to say, you mentioned 4K um, and you mentioned 5G, Gordon. Is, is it similar to the problems we have in the past where H.264 was really good for 1080p and lower and HEVC was good for 4K? Does 5G, 4G sort of fit that same model as well? So we're, we're testing the, the, that on, and do we have to adapt the bit rate to, when, you go, when you go to 4G? And so we're testing it by itself and we're testing it with, with 5G. Right now we're doing bonding and, and you, don't have to, you don't have to do anything with the, the bit rate. Um, but uh, I think we still have a little more testing uh, to do on that, to be honest. Okay, good. Sorry, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, we, uh, we recently ran a story on streamingmedia.com about a 5G remote production demo that went on during the virtual IBC a couple of weeks ago between London and Amsterdam. And it was a partnership between uh, Huawei, BBC, uh, it was either Samsung or Sony. Uh, and, and, and a great quote that came out of that, one of the takeaways according to a Huawei spokesperson was that 5G can deliver very high data rates and very low and very predictable latency and high reliability, but can't necessarily do all of those things in all use cases. Gordon, what, uh, how do you respond to that and some of the issues and challenges with, uh, with 5G, even though we're certainly moving in that direction? Well, you know, part of it is, you know, where, where are you in, in the rollout of, of 5G for, you know, like the AWS Wavelink Zone or, you know, the Azure or Google equivalents. And um, so, you know, what, what cities are you in? Uh, but I think you're going to see hybrid workflows. I think you're going to see, uh, you know, contribution coming in over the open internet and being distributed with 5G and, and, and vice versa and a mixing and matching of these technologies and, and redundancy with, with these mixed uh, uh, technologies. And also, you know, 5G's, you know, you know, has trouble going through a piece of paper, right? So, you know, you, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta have the antenna and it's gotta be in the right place. And, and, and if not, you gotta, you gotta switch it to a different technology. So, you know, there, there's some challenges, but there's some, some real solid workflows that you can actually put in production now. It sort of reminds me of the problems we had with ultra wideband years ago, where it was great if you did line of sight, you know, 15 feet away, but as you said, throw a piece of paper and it causes problems. Um, one of the questions that came, came up in the Q and A here is somebody is asking about the cost of 5G broadcasting equipment, reaching a level of affordability for smaller broadcasters. That's a valid point because obviously a, it's undried technology, which tends to mean there's a lot of R&D behind it and it pushes the price up. But B, it, it's a assumptive model that they're going to be broadcasters who want to do this beyond just the traditional um, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile delivery. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. We're, we're, so we're, we're kind of breaking all the equipment that they put in front of us as you start imagine streaming and then throwing congestion and everything into the you know multiple streams 4k streams into these boxes so we're we're figuring out the chipsets that work we're helping you know really Verizon think about their manufacturing strategy but there are already um helping us on this um this this test we're doing with Verizon and, and AWS Wavelink Zone is a company called Jigcasters and relatively small company but they have very very cost effective 
uh, equipment that can do this and, and do it do it well. So uh, there are options already out there. Uh, for and that's a great one. Goodcasters is a great company. Yeah, they are. Yeah, Casey's been, you know, and he's been, you know, if we need something built, he'll build it and send it to us the next day, right? So just to make sure we're optimizing, and then he's going to put it in production and sell it. So he's. He's well, it and, it too. and that's the thing. <laughs> he has that production background and wants to constantly push forward on the envelope. So I think that's a that's an ideal test model. So yeah, exactly. All right, moving on. Um, I know there's another question on 5G, but let's move on, Eric, and then we can try to come back to that later. Yeah, yeah. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, so now let's take a big picture uh, look at the industry. And we tried to get a sense of what level of impact 5G is going to have on companies' video streaming strategies. And uh, again, if you combine the medium and high here, you'll see that, and game changer, you'll see that well over 50% think that it's going to have a significant impact on their video streaming strategy. Um, Tim, what do you make out of these numbers? I, I agree with you, Eric, but I'm also surprised um, that almost half say that it's low or no impact. I, I think ultimately, to Gordon's points before, part of this is educating the industry on the capabilities of what you can do with it. One of the questions that came up in the Q&A is, you know, how do you deal with people who can't get 5G signals? Obviously, bonding is one of the ways that you, you go about that or stepping down to 4G LTE advance. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think one of the things that the industry is saying in this particular question, or the responses here is, we're gonna hold off on saying that it's going to be significant until we see that it's capable of doing what the hype has claimed. That's my take on it. I, I, would, I would agree with that. I, I've had a, a number of, 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 you know, senior, senior people in this industry saying, well, what does 5G have to do with my you know, my broadcast workflows, that's a consumer thing. So there's still a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it misinformation. There's just, you know, everybody needs to be educated. And when we start rolling these things out live and people see what they do and what the economics are and what the, the value prop is, I, you know, I, I think it'll change. But, you know, right now it's, it's so new that I, I think most people you know, the, the, the low impact, no impact is almost, uh, the answer is, I don't know right now. Fair point. And I, I think, Eric, this is one of those questions, and the reason we're doing these state of streaming surveys is to look at these over time. And so when we do the next one, you know, six months, nine months down the line, we'll see whether this has changed into higher impact for, you know, two thirds or, or three quarters. Absolutely. And another uh, question along those lines is regarding machine learning. Uh, and that leads us to our, our last slide for today. Uh, over the next 24 months, how do you envision your organization using machine learning? Uh, machine learning, uh, it, it's interesting. One of the things that you miss about not having an IBC or an NAB to go to is, is you're not seeing what's on everybody's booth, right? And I know that uh, last year at IBC, everything was machine learning or claimed to be machine learning, whether it actually was or not. Uh, as our colleague Dom Robinson is always quick to remind us. But more and more uh, streaming infrastructures are including machine learning at some point in the process. And here you see how people responded to the ways they are using machine learning uh, in their infrastructure right now. Quality of service is right there at the top. And you can see the numbers on your screen. Predictive maintenance and transport optimization are tied at two. Tim, thoughts on this? Sure. So I, I think it's really interesting that predictive maintenance and transport optimization are tied for second place because to a point Gordon made earlier, you know, when you do a software defined network and you've got a control panel or a dashboard, what you're looking for there is where are my potential issues going to lie? Not are my, are parts of my workflow down? It's where, where are we starting to see a yellow light? Uh, as opposed to a, a green light, so to speak, in a dashboard. And then if we do find that we're going to require maintenance on something, can we then reconfigure the transport to optimize it for that period of time? 
I'm old school enough that I remember sonnet rings, you know, in the telco world where if it got, if the fiber got cut one direction, everything worked back the other way. Ultimately, those were hard coded solutions in, but machine learning, the idea here being if you give it the business parameters, it will then work with you as opposed to doing something that's just a hard coded solution. Um, anomaly detection obviously fits in part of that. And then security, I see that as things like authentication um, and making sure, say, that the transport encryption is secure, but that fell further down the list. So I, I do think predictive maintenance, anomaly detection, and then how do you optimize the transport in those problem periods you know, are, are sort of key uses of machine learning. Yeah, I, I look at this and I look at two and four predictive maintenance anomaly detection and I say that they're, they're related because mm -hmm. one, one, one feeds the other. And I'd say that, you know, everything here, the first four anyways, are all about quality of service. Um, so, and so that's not surprising. So we're already doing things like, um, so we'll do PSNR, uh, the, the um, encoder quality scoring and other scoring like that. What we do, we use machine learning to predict encoder uh, quality um, without seeing the source stream. So we call it EPSNR. And so we can get that to 99% probability that we can tell you, we think you have an encoder problem before you get the stream, right? So we're, tr we're always trying to predict rather than just alert on a problem. And, and you'll see us doing more and more of that. Transport's interesting. We were working a lot on using machine learning to optimize our transport. And we've learned a lot of things that turned out to be better to be hard coded in than to be really, so machine learning taught us that, but we haven't quite uh, you know, figured out exactly how to use machine learning to optimize transport real time. But we have learned a lot from it and it's making our, our protocol uh, even better. So and there's, and there's things you can learn from it even if you don't necessarily put it into production. And I was gonna say, I think over the next 24 months, hopefully some of the learnings will be as well fuzzy logic applications in terms of making those decisions as opposed to, to hard coding if possible. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, that's been a great overview of the 2020 state of the streaming industry report. Uh, Tim, real quick before we go, what other questions can people expect to see answered in that report, which they will receive uh, if they are on this call today? Sure. So one of the big questions that we we look at um, every time we've done this is what are the revenue models? Um, free, ad supported, subscription supported. That's that's one that we see a bit of a shift from last time. And then two other areas are looking at on-demand premium content versus episodic content, as well as the types of live events. Sports obviously fell a bit lower, although surprisingly not as low because as Gordon mentioned, live linear you know, is allowing some stabilization there. And then um, different types of, of breaking news content. So those are some of the areas. Um, the other will be the orders of priority in terms of the um, geographies around the world where companies are thinking that they're going to be focusing their efforts. And then I guess the, the final part of it is what comprises the industry in terms of the multiple sub-industries? Who are the people who responded and, and what size percentage do we have for each sub-industry? So I think those are important questions to, to answer to allow people to get the, the trends going forward as we go into 2021. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tim. Thank you so much, Gordon and Zixi, for sponsoring the 2020 Autumn State of the Streaming Industry Survey. Again, if you're on this webinar right now, you'll get a copy of the survey without having to do anything else. Uh, thanks for joining us at our first Streaming Media West Connect session for the week. Come on back in a little less than an hour for a look at CMAF and the future of OTT.